wabarakatuh. Welcome to the plenary session uh, this afternoon. And insha'Allah, uh, at this session, we will have three speakers. One from the Association of the Universities of Arab World, or Arab Universities. And then we have uh, another speaker from Malaysia, one from IAUM, uh, Professor Datuk Sri Dr. Zaleha Kamaruddin, and the other one is Professor Datuk Dr. Musa Ahmad from USIM, University Science Malaysia. All right. Um, to proceed with this session, I would like to um, open or to uh, commence with the recitation of Basmalah together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ladies and gentlemen, the rectors or deputy rectors of the Islamic uh, universities in Indonesia. At this particular moment, Alhamdulillah, UNISULA has been greatly honored to host this very important event. And this event actually is an annual event where all the leaders of the private Islamic universities in Indonesia sit together in order to discuss matters related to the um, performance or to improvement of the performance of education, Islamic education in, in Indonesia. Our conference, our international conference, uh, at this uh, particular moment, we have a broad theme that is Islamization of higher education institution toward the global uh, competitiveness. So it is something that everybody knows that the performance of Islamic universities still lagging behind. Let alone to talk about the Islamic education in Indonesia. At the international level, many has tried to improve their uh, performance in education. But then uh, there are so many uh, issues that need to be addressed. And the address, uh, the, 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 the issues that we are going to address uh, today, inshallah, is on the um, how to internationalize our higher Islamic education. Because now we cannot live alone in alienation from the other part of the world. So, at this session, we will uh, listen to uh, three respected speakers from different uh, backgrounds and represent the different uh, <coughs> territories or areas. And uh, to run this program, I will be a bit dictator. I will use my power to cut the what the speech if the speech exceed the time. I think we have to agree on this because our 
tradition here in Unisula. When the Adhan is already announced, then we have to stop. Everybody has to go to Masjid. See, this is our tradition here. So we have about one and a half, yeah, one hour and a half, inshallah. So within this uh, one hour and a half, hopefully we will be able to address the important issues uh, faced by our higher Islamic education institution. First of all, I would like to call upon Professor, that Professor Sultan, Professor Dr. Sultan uh, Abu Arabi Al Adwan. He is the president of the Association of Arab Universities. And we are lucky today that uh, he managed to come to our conference. And we have to thank him. And um, welcome to Unisula, Prof, and welcome to Indonesia. Hopefully, uh, you can share with us the experience of uh, running the higher education in the Arab world. And I think uh, your association is not only to Islamic higher education, but to all Arab universities, I think. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this experience, I think, is very important for us. <coughs> Uh, especially at this particular juncture uh, where we have to uh, hand in hand with our uh, partners from all over the world. Professor Al Adwan has been the rector of different universities in Jordan. So he is from Jordan. And uh, the last one, I think, the rector of uh, Yarmouk, yeah. University of Yarmouk, uh, Jordan. So without further ado, I would like to call upon Prof. Uh, Sultan Al Adwan to present. Uh, on the higher education, right, in the Arab world. Please welcome uh, Professor Al Adwan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. My dear brother, Professor Anis Malik, thanks so much for the introduction. I think you took 20 minutes from our times. And this, we will count it. Uh, my dear brothers, sisters, colleagues, friends, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am so honored and delighted to be here in this conference. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me to be with you this afternoon, and especially my dear brother, Professor Anis Malik. And I'm also proud to be among two other speakers. I know them very well, Dr. Zaliha, Kamaruddin, just a few months ago, she hosted the Arab ASEAN Conference in Higher Education at the International Islamic University, where we had more than 100 rectors from both regions, from the Arab region and also from the ASEAN regions. And three years back, my dear brother, Professor Musa Ahmad, who is also a chemist like me, hosted the second Arab ASEAN conference in, at UCIM that time. 
Therefore, we feel like we are one family. And that's the way it should be. We are brothers and sisters. We are the same nations, the same ummah, and we should work together. If we look at the higher education in the Arab world, I will start. Here, the Arab world, 12 countries in Asia and 10 countries in Africa. You can see from the West, here is Mauritania, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, and Somalia and Djibouti. This is in Africa. And here, the, the Middle East, in the, the Asian, here is Qatar, very small, tiny country, where my colleagues, the three of them over there. And here is Jordan, which is close to Palestine. Actually, education in the Arab world started with Islam. The first verse on Quran was sent to Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam, Iqra, read, Iqra. That's where Quran is the beginning of education in the Islamic world, not only in the Arab world, in the Islamic world. And during that time, a lot of places used to be used for teaching and learning, and it's called madrasa. In the eighth century, the first college or university was established, which is a Zaytuna University in Tunisia. 734, and also Al Qarawiyin University in Morocco, Al Azhar Sharif in Egypt, Al Mustansriya in Baghdad in Iraq, and some other universities were established in the Andalus area, like Kurnata and Cordoba and other places in the Andalus area. And during that time, most of the universities were working according to the endowment, Al-Waqf al-Islami. Non-profit universities. Those universities established in that time, in the 8th and the 9th and the 10th century, many years before Bologna University, which is the oldest university in Europe, which was established in 1088. The European countries, they are proud of Polonia, but we were ahead of them during that time. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al ilm walaw fussin. Go to China for more further education and learning. And during that time, a lot of European students and scholars, they used to come and study in the Islamic countries. Bayt al-Hikmah in Baghdad was very famous for many fields like astronomy, chemistry, physics, mathematics, even medicine that, during that time. Education and higher education in the Islamic countries in the Arab world that time began to decline in, in the beginning of the 16th century. Because if you are strong, your education is strong. If you are weak, your higher education and education system is going to be weak. And in the 18th century, 
some missionaries schools were built in the Arab world like in North Africa or in Lebanon or in other parts of the Arab world the French system or the French opened the new schools in North Africa and in Lebanon and in Syria that time for example the American University of Beirut was established 1866 whereas St. Joseph University is a French university established nine years later 1875 in the modern history higher education is re recent in the Arab world most of the Arab students during last century they used to study in a few universities in the Arab world but mostly they go to Pakistan to India to Russia to Turkey to Europe to the States until 1953 this is almost 60 years back we had only 14 universities in the Arab world you can see them five in Egypt three in Lebanon one in Syria one in Algeria one in Sudan one in, Sy in, in Morocco and one in Tunisia during the last 25 or 28 years a lot of private universities were established in the Arab countries and Jordan was the first Arab country to have a private universities Amman al Ahliya University established 1990 nowadays you find almost 400 universities <coughs> as a private universities in the Arab world 400 out of a total 1,000 universities in the Arab world nowadays. For example, look at Lebanon. Lebanon is a small country with 5 million inhabitants. They have almost 50 universities. They have only one public university, whereas the rest are private universities. Go to Egypt, for example, you will find nowadays more than 50 universities in Egypt, almost 50 and 50 percent. United Arab Emirates, they have 77 universities in, in this country, but mostly they are private universities. If we look at the total number of students in the Arab countries nowadays, we have almost around 14 million students. The total population of the Arab countries, around 400 million people. Those 14 million students, 55% of them, they are the females. I was really impressed this morning when I saw the female here. They compose almost 80% of the total population of this university. Therefore, for the female, number is growing in all the Islamic countries. The 14 million students, 90% of them, they are undergraduate students. And only about 10 or 12%, they are studying higher education, especially graduate programs like master or doctorate degrees. If we look at the different countries in the Arab world, nowadays, especially with the war, what is going on in the Arab countries, unfortunately. For example, Yemen. Yemen is a huge country, but during the last three years, a lot of war is going in Yemen. You find most of the students, they cannot go to school now. The same thing happened to Syria and to Iraq. Therefore, we have to increase those students in those countries they are going through a lot of struggles a lot of challenges but we have to increase number of educators in those countries you 
can see here the number of universities. 2003, we had 233. In 2006, we had 286 universities. Ten years later, the number has been increased to more 1,000 universities in the Arab countries. The Arab world today faces a lot of problems and challenges when it comes to higher education and scientific research, including the lack of clear focus on research priorities and strategies, insufficient time and funding to meet the research goals, which means low quality of infrastructure in most of the Arab countries, low awareness of the importance and the impact of good scientific research, also limited international collaborative efforts and, of course, the brain drainage. I will try to concentrate on three important challenges from those. The first challenge is the quality assurance. Yes, indeed, we have so many universities. As I said, we have almost over a thousand universities. We have over 14 million students. We have more than 250,000 faculty members. But do our graduate students are well trained, are well equipped? Do we graduate good students? Do them, those students meet the market, the local market, the international market? Therefore, our association, the Association of Arab Universities, which started in 1964. We had the first General Assembly for our association in 1969. We had that time only 23 universities, and we had the General Assembly meeting was held at Alexandria University in Egypt. And since that time, the number of universities under our umbrella has been increased. Nowadays, we have almost 400 universities under the umbrella of the Association of Arab Universities. What ARO, the Association of Arab Universities, did for this regard to face the first challenge, it is the quality assurance. As a result of globalization, Competitiveness and accelerating expansion of a private higher education, it is necessary to take several actions, such as to establish national quality assurance framework and to develop current established ones in order to guarantee the quality of education and control its outcome. Also to develop and enhance and review current internal quality management system. To encourage establishing regional quality assurance network to help promoting quality assurance of higher education in the region. To build capacities for education quality assurance system. To enhance international cooperation in fields of higher education quality assurance. The role of our association in quality assurance, 2006, we established QAAC, which is the Quality Assurance and Accreditation Council. The vision of this council to guarantee a high quality precision for higher education institute of our members. And the mission to assist Arab universities to improve their quality through spreading of the culture of quality assurance, preparing guides and books for this. So far, we have published around 15 books and manuals, and this has been spread 
to all over the universities and colleges for the quality assurance. The second challenge is the scientific research. The Arab countries, as I mentioned, we are more than 400 million people. And most of our Arab countries, they have very good natural resources, like gas or oil in the Gulf countries, or big countries like Egypt, Sudan, Algeria, Morocco. But unfortunately, we are not spending enough money on scientific research. We are spending between 0.2 to 0.6 percent of our GDP on scientific research. Even we are very rich countries. Whereas the industrialized and the Western countries, they are spending between 2 to 6 percent of their GDP of the, on the scientific research. Number of researchers in the Arab world around 500 to 600 researchers per 1 million inhabitant, whereas this number in the Western countries could reach to 6,000 researchers. If you look at here at this screen, you find Israel, the enemy of the Arabs, as well as the enemy for the Muslim people, they are putting a lot of money for research. The highest in the world when it comes to GDP. Finland, Singapore, but you don't find many of the Arab or the Islamic countries here. For example, Turkey or Malaysia and Iran, they are putting almost 1% of our GDP in their own research. Look at the Arab countries, you'll find Tunisia and Morocco the highest in the expenditure of scientific research. We would like to see the Gulf countries spend more money on scientific research and on education. Yes, they are spending good money on education, but not on scientific research. Number of publication. The Arab countries, they compose around 6% of the total population of the world. But unfortunately, their contribution to scientific research, number of publications or number of patents is not 6%. Even it is not 0.6%. It is less than 0.5%. Israel by itself, producing four times as the Arab total when it comes to research. Number of publications, number of patents. Here you can see the patent applications. And here in the Arab countries, not much. We would love to see more papers and more patents in the Islamic and in the Arab countries. <clears throat> what we have done during the last few years, we launched the fund scientific research in our association. And we have launched several conferences, several workshops to study the importance and the priorities of problems facing the Arab countries. For example, energy, water, pollution, food, and things like this. And now we are hoping that we'll get some money from some of the Arab countries in order to la launch such important research.
we are coming to the third important challenge facing not only the Arab countries, but all the Muslim countries, and even all the developed countries, which is the brain drainage. Usually we teach our students, they get the bachelor degree, they go abroad to study graduate studies, master or doctoral degrees. Most of our good students, when they go to Europe or to the States or even to Canada or Australia or New Zealand, they don't like to come home. They stay over there. 31% of the total brain drainage from developing countries are from the Arab countries. 50% of them are doctors, 23% are engineers, 15% of the Arab talents, they usually go to Europe or to America. 34% of the physicians working in the UK, they are Arabs or Muslims. 75% of the total scientific talent migration in Canada and US and Britain are Arabs and Muslims. 54% of our students who are studying abroad, they don't have the desire to come home. You can see those percentages, very dangerous. How can we sustain development in our region, here in Indonesia, or in Malaysia, or in Turkey, or in the Arab countries, if we are losing the cream of the cream? Why are we li losing those good students? The political instability in the region. During the 60s and the 70s, Iraq used to be the best country, not only in the Arab countries, but in the whole Middle East. That's according to UNESCO report. Look what happened to Iraq now. After the American invasion to Iraq, a lot of good scientists left Iraq. Where are they now? They are in America, or in Europe, or New Zealand, or Australia. The same thing is happening now to the Syrians. The same thing happening to the Yemen. Look at Dr. Dahoud. He used to be a president of a university in Yemen. Now he is here. Therefore, we are losing the good scientists in the Arab region. And social injustice. Absence of the right environment for research or the infrastructure. Lack of research facilities and low quality of research standards. Lack of freedoms in most of the Arab countries. Lack of work motivation and incentives. Low salaries. But in the meantime, we have seen some achievement during the last six or ten years. Saudi Arabia, for example, around seven years ago, they had more than 160,000 students studying abroad. Around 120,000 studying in the U.S. And also, Saudi Arabia launched the University Scientific Research Coast. Kung Abdullah, University for Science and Technology. Dubai, United Arab Emirates. They have the international academic city where many universities established. And then you have the scholarship for Muhammad bin Rashid Al Maktoum. Bahrain, 
They have put hundreds of millions of dollars for good universities in Bahrain. Qatar, for example, leading university and industry partnership and Qatar Foundation. We have three gentlemen here from Qatar Foundation. They are from Khalifa University in Qatar. Therefore, Qatar is trying to put enough money now for establishing new universities, but we are hoping that research will be a good outcome for those. As I mentioned, the Association of Arab Universities established in 1964. Our goal is to work together within the Arab universities. But during the last six, seven years, we felt that we should go outside the Arab world. We came to Malaysia, and we had the Arab ASEAN Conference on Higher Education. We went to China. We went to Turkey. We went to Europe, and just the beginning of this year, in February 2018, we formed a new association, a new federation with the Russian universities, the Federation of Russian Arab Universities. Therefore, we are working with the international arena. And here, that's the way it should be. Scientific research and ed education should not have borders. And we should enhance the collaboration. Today, we signed many agreements here. But those agreements, are we going to implement it? Are we going to use it? That's the way it should be. We should work together as Islamic countries from different regions, Islamic scholars. We have to work together and to do something together. Look at the West. Europe and the States, how they are working together. We should work together. We should have more conferences like this. We should know each other and try to work together. I think I should stop here. Not more time. No more. Well, in the end, I should thank once again this university, Professor Anis Malik and his team who organized this conference, and we thank you so much for listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran ala iltizam bil mawaid. Wa afan ala isus muhatad al-tawbut. Yani ana waqifukum قبل إكمال التقديم إن شاء الله. طيب جزاك الله خير رف العدوان. kita beri tepuk tangan yang meriah pada beliau. Bapa dan ibu sekalian, hadirin hadirat. Apa yang dipresentasikan terkait dengan pengalaman negara-negara Arab dalam mengelola pendidikan tinggi adalah Pertama, persoalan quality assurance, jaminan mutu. Penjaminan mutu memang persoalan yang kita hadapi bersama. Khususnya di Indonesia ini kita sedang menggeliat dan kita tadi mendengar bersama-sama bagaimana uh, Bapak Menteri Ristek Dikti benar-benar menerapkan, bisa dikatakan tangan besi dalam hal ini, dalam rangka untuk memastikan uh, penjaminan mutu uh, pembelajaran dan pendidikan yang ada di perguruan tinggi di Indonesia yang jumlahnya melebihi 4.600 universitas. Jadi jumlah yang sangat besar sekali. Beberapa waktu yang lalu saya ingat dari Bapak uh, Direk Dirjen Kelembagaan Prof. Padono menyampaikan bahwa perguruan tinggi Indonesia ini sudah tersesat terlalu jauh ke jalan yang salah. Tersesat terlalu jauh ke jalan yang salah. Ini dari Kementerian Dikti yang menegaskan ini. 
Dan memang kalau kita e, rasakan bersama, ada benarnya apa yang beliau sampaikan. Oleh karena itu, e, kita hendaknya ber, apa, kerjasama dengan e, Kementerian Ristek Dikti ini dengan sungguh-sungguh kita meskipun perguruan tinggi Islam swasta, kita buktikan bahwa kita mampu untuk e, memastikan penjaminan mutu ini. Yang kedua, poor scientific research. Jadi memang kita mengalami eh, apa, kemiskinan di dalam eh, penelitian ilmiah ini. Kita banyak mengalami eh, kemunduran ataupun jika dibandingkan dengan negara-negara tangga, kita masih sangat jauh. Betul angka tadi yang disampaikan oleh Bapak Menteri, bahwa kita sudah sampai 18 ribuan, tapi dari sekian ratus ribu dosen dan peneliti yang ada di Indonesia. Beda di, jika kita bandingkan dengan Malaysia. Kita jauh lebih besar jumlah dosen kita, jumlah perguruan tinggi kita. Ya, apalagi kalau dibandingkan dengan Singapura juga yang memang sangat kecil, terbatas sekali. Jadi poor scientific research. Dan yang ketiga adalah brain drain. Jadi saya rasa ini juga persoalan yang kita hadapi bersama. Banyak sekali ahli-ahli dan apa saintis kita Indonesia ini juga juga mengalami hal yang sama, fenomena yang dialami oleh negara-negara Arab. Ya. Jadi para pimpinan perguruan tinggi pada saat ini yang hadir uh, dari BKS PTIS, mudah-mudahan ini juga menjadi perhatian kita bersama dalam rapat kerja nasional ini. Saya kira demikian ringkasan dari apa yang tadi disampaikan oleh uh, Profesor Sultan Al-Adwan. Uh, berikutnya, I don't know, according to the uh, according to the timetable yang saya ada itu uh, Profesor Datuk Musa, baru kemudian Profesor Datuk Sri Zaleha. Jadi kemudian yang sekarang I would like to call upon Profesor Datuk Musa to deliver his speech. Terima kasih Datuk Musa. Datuk Musa adalah uh, naib chancellor. Naib chancellor itu setara rektor kalau di Indonesia. University Science Islam Malaysia. Please welcome Datuk uh, Musa. Terima kasih Pak Anies. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera eh, dan salam uh, satu se-Indonesia. Si Dari alhamdulillah yang pertamanya, uh, saya ingin ucapkan terima kasih banyak-banyak kepada pimpinan okay, di Unisula, kepada rektor yang baru dan juga kepada rektor yang telah menjemput saya ke um, Unisula pada kali ini. Saya sebenarnya asalnya daripada Ponorogo, kakeknya. Dan juga Karanganyar. Jadi memang bila pergi Indonesia ini macam balik kampung. Jadi saya tak tahu memang akan pergi Indonesia. Untuk tahun ini saja ini kali ketiga ke Indonesia. Tahun de uh, Bulan depan akan ke Indonesia, ke Jogja pula insyaAllah. Um, tapi ini adalah kali pertama di Semarang. Terima kasih. So thank you very much okay, to you know, the uh, Penitia. Right. Um, I mean, the title that I'm, I'm going to share today, basically on the embedding the soul in Islamic higher education curriculum towards global peace. This is really very important. Why? Okay, because at the moment, most of the higher education institution, what we're offering to our students, actually there is no soul inside. Therefore, even though the student needs to graduate from the university with a higher degree, for instance, but since there is no soul, And you will see some other adverse effects that are going to occur. All right. Um, I would like to start okay, by quoting what been said by Aristotle. So uh, Aristotle mentioned that educating the mind without edu edu educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. 
you educate your student, but there is no soul in it. There's no, I mean, you are not educating the heart. So there's no impact at all, okay? Meaning, okay, I mean, there will, I mean, I mean, there will no, we will expect that there will be no impact, you know, to the, to the graduates. And uh, another, another quotation, you know, by Joseph Edison. Joseph Edison mentioned that I consider a human soul without education is like a marble in a quarry which shows none of its inherent beauties till the still of the polisher um, fetches out, you know, the colors. Meaning, okay, if you give education, you know, to human, I mean, a human soul, if you're not really educating, you know, the, the human soul, it's like, it's like marble without you polishing it. But if you polish the marble, okay, then you will see the value of the marbles. You will see the, the, the shining of the surface. You will see the veins of the marble. You will see, you know, basically the contour and the, the pattern of it, and that's really giving a price to the marbles. So education and soul, education and soul is something which is inseparable. Okay, when you give education, it has to go together with the soul. Right. Okay, this is actually a book that we published, and I think many of us already read this book. This is published by one, one of your professors in Howard University. I mean, the, um, the title is actually Education Without a Soul. Okay, it, Education Without a Soul. So this is written by Professor, Professor Harry Lewis. Professor Harry Lewis actually has been serving Howard University for more than 30 years, and he has been appointed as a dean for more than eight years. So he wrote this book basically because out of his frustrations, which occurred to him, you know, you see, he have forgotten that the fundamental purpose of undergraduate education is to turn the young people into adults who will take responsibility for society. Okay, meaning, you give very good education, but still, since the soul is not there, okay, so you're producing very good educated, you know, uh, people, but, I mean, I mean, it's become very, very dry, okay, very dry. So some you see higher education, you know, in that time, basically, uh, a clear decline in moral uh, education. Uh, college and universities of the past, moral teaching came directly from the church and teaching. Meaning, in the past, they used to have curriculum that had been offered in the university, and, but the soul part, you know, the religious part coming from the, from the church. But now, no longer. They separate that because of the secular, uh, secularism. They separate that. Religion is religion, and academic is academic. Okay? And you can see some of the statistics okay? in terms of the, um, I mean, the absence of soul through moral and religious educating has led to the increase in white collar uh, criminals or crimes. So you can see the number is increasing up to around about 20%, okay, about 20% is quite high. Okay? And mostly you can see, you know, I mean, different type of uh, color, white collar crime, okay, that you can see easily from the statistic that can be published and you can see that if you Google easily, you know, in the, in the internet. So what is peace? I mean, in order for us, you know, to create peace in this world, you're going to run away, okay, from education. In order to give very meaningful education, you cannot run away, you know, from, I mean, inject, injecting soul in the education. So, I mean, in a general, edu I mean, in general definitions, a peace is basically absence of violence. That's the basic, you know, the definition of peace. Actually, it's absence of violence, but absence, absence of violence alone actually is not enough, okay? So we have what they, what they call here negative peace, positive peace, and cal culture of peace. So culture of peace actually, whereby, okay, we, we, we train, you know, the, the, the people, okay, to have a culture of peace. I mean, some of the criteria will include, you know, I mean, the rejection of any violence, okay, that occur, okay, in the, in the, in the society. Right, uh, and profile of a peaceful nations. This is actually some of the indicator, okay, for you to indicate whether the society actually is it a peaceful society or otherwise. This is some of the criteria that you can you can see. Um, I mean, among others, very low level of inter internal conflicts, 
uh, very efficient, accountable governments, okay, always relate with the governments, uh, very strong economics, okay, no poverty, more or less, okay, because poverty will, will basically, you know, I mean, will, will, will let us towards, you know, um, I mean, conflicts, okay? So integrated populations and good relation with the international community. All right, this is actually the GPI, the Global Peace Index. I think everybody knows about this. This has been published basically by the Institute for Economic and Peace. I mean, they have a few parameters, okay? They have three parameters, okay, that, that they use, okay? And then they will rank each country's according to, according to what you call, according to the um, parameters okay, that they use. And uh, they're going to, to publish, you know, at the GPI every year, and basically you can you can see okay whether uh, our country, you know, is it is it going up or is it going down and so on. Okay, but in this case, you know, for Malaysia, okay, for 2018, we are placed number 20, 25. <laughs> okay, so I think maybe because it is not that bad at all. And the other thing, okay, you can see, you know, I think from the from the graph here, okay, from the from the bar over there. The green one is representing, you know, the very peaceful countries, mostly located in Europe, <laughs> and the other, the other end, you know, actually, is I mean, the very like, non-peaceful countries, mostly actually among the Arabs, you know, the, the conflicts because of conflict that we have. So something that we ask, okay, because Islam actually is so peaceful. Islam means peace, isn't it? Okay, but and yet, okay, this is the challenge that we're going to, to face, okay, because of. Most of the countries that consider not safe, okay, at least um, among the Islamic countries. Right. So if you look at the uh, meaning of Islam, it's Islam uh, coming from from um, I mean simply means submission, and it is derived from a word again okay, meaning peace. So I mean the word Islam itself actually you know uh, very giving us very good indication okay that we are the agent of a peace okay, in this world. We are the ambassador of peace, okay, basically. So the other meaning of Islam is peace with the creator, peace of mind and heart, uh, and peace with other fellow human beings. Okay? So it's a very comprehensive meaning of Islam. So I mean the word Islam itself already tells us that we are the ambassador of peace okay, in this world. But whether we are, we are, we are using, whether we are implementing our role or not, that's another story. And in fact, if you refer to a lot of verses in Quran, you know, we'll see so many verses in Quran that reflecting, okay, that we should make peace. This is an example of it. Don't make war with, with those who offer peace, okay? So partly, you know, from Surah Al-Nisa and from Surah Al-Muntahana. Right. And it is basically, you know, because normally, uh, you know, we're talking about Islamophobia, Actually, people will see Islam as a terrorist. Okay? But this is actually very, very simple research been done, you know, by one of the researchers, I can't remember his name. Actually, they compare, you know, how many words on war, peace, fighting, destroy, uh, kill, sword, mercy, merciful, gracious in the Quran as well as in the Bible. Okay? They took two Bible in this case, actually, the American Standard Bible and King James Bible. And they, I mean, they, 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 they calculate, okay, those kind of how many times appear in the Bible as well in the Quran. So we'll see, I mean, the finding. The word mercy, merciful, and gracious, these are very positive words. So actually, in the, in the Quran, actually, you can see, I mean, appear the highest compared to, compared to um, the number that appear in Bible, either King James or American Standard. And similarly, for the, for the negative words, you know, war, a fighting, destroy, a kill, sword, and so on, actually, the number that appear in Quran actually much, much less, okay, compare the number that appear, okay, the same word that appear in the Bible. Okay, that, that shows to us something, okay, that Quran never uh, teach us to become a violent or to become a terrorist. All right. Science technology is something that we can run away from, okay? Because like it or not, you know, so with science and technology, we, 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 we try to make our, 
life as comfortable as possible. But cell technology it is very wise. If, if we manipulate cell technology, um, I mean with the proper uh, guideline and so on, this might going to give us adverse effect. Okay? I mean, uh, for that reason, um, science and technology, you know, I mean, we, we, not, we need to use this, uh, the, this uh, science and technology in a proper way so that it will, be, it will give a benefit okay, uh, to the Ummah. So, in this sense, I just like to focus on the environment because science technology is very wide for this, for this uh, discussion. I just like to focus on environment alone. Right, I don't know whether this uh, slide, I mean, uh, <laughs> it seems to be not very clear. But what I'm trying to say here, actually, you know, the relationship, the ecosystem ecology, okay, between, um, between, between human and also, um, you know, the living things and, you know, the unliving things around us. So there is some kind of interaction, and this interaction is very important. It's kind of like it's dynamic, okay? I mean, equilibrium between us, between, between you know, the, the man and also, you know, the, the surrounding environments. And we call this as ecosystem ecology. So in ecosystem ecology, actually, this kind of like, you know, uh, very dynamic equilibrium between a human being and um, a plants, you know, um, animals, and also, you know, the surrounding environment like air, water, and so on. So, if you go very, very quickly, environmental cycle, we have a lot of cycle, and this actually happened in our environment, and this appears naturally. I mean, Allah has created this world so that each of the cycle will appear on their own, and this cycle will maintain, I mean, the... The, the, the amount of water will maintain the amount of oxygen, for instance, will maintain the amount of nutrient, you know. And this occurs actually, you know, uh, naturally. And we have so many things over this, and so many cycles. And this is what we call as a mizan or balance. So everything actually, you know, Allah creates this world, at least everything is balanced. You talk about the cycle of nitrogen, cycle of nutrient, cycle of water, and so on. So, I mean, in order to maintain this balance, we need somebody with have a soul, somebody educated but with a soul inside. So this is actually one of the terms that have been used in, 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 uh, in chemistry. I'm a chemist, you know, like Professor Sultan. So we use what I call as dynamic equilibrium, whereby, you know, I mean, when, when you make a reaction in the lab, okay, I, mean, the, I mean, the equilibrium will occur between the product and the reactants until they reach certain equilibrium. So similarly, similarly, you know, in our environment, we will see this kind of environment or the cycle as I mentioned earlier. So I mean, with the intervention from the human beings, they, this will occur naturally and in a way it's going to maintain, you know, our, our, our environment okay, and make it more conducive okay, for us to live. And <clears throat> so sun and society has to, 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 to stay... Um, together, hand in hand, and in order to do this, okay, so we need to have, um, just like science going to produce values, method, and product, and society is going to accept, you know, the tragedy that we have, and we need to sustain whatever we have, okay, so that, I mean, the life okay, can, can, be, can be continued. Uh, well, I just very go quickly between science Tawhidi and science secular. You know, that science secular is whereby when you learn science, you totally put aside, you know, the, the religion. But in some study, you learn science together with, with religion, so that science will bring you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The science will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what, what, what I'm saying, you know, um, the, the, what you call it, you know, the soul that we inject, you know, in our uh, uh, curriculum. Right, and this is the, actually basically the pathway. In, this is the pathway showing, you know, the uh, secular science, whereby you will have only yourself and you have your environment, you know, or your, your what you call it, your, your nature. So you do your science, okay, you do the investigation, the research and so on, but that's it, okay, but that's it. Uh, this one actually, the, the, the Tawhidic, okay, and we always, you can see the difference. In Tawhidic, we always refer to Allah SWT, which is going to bring closer to us. Sorry. Right. So as a result, okay, so you can see if we don't have really a proper 
uh, management of our environment. So we we'll have, you know, some uh, adverse effect like what we see this, you know, the, the very good forest is becoming, you know, very deserted forest. Similarly, water become very polluted. And in fact, you know, in, in, in Quran, I mean, you know, you can find ayah and hadith that really can be applied in order to show that Islam is really very, very encouraging, very stringent in terms of keeping, you know, the sustainability of water. Okay, these are the two ayahs. I have no time to explain this. All right? And is poverty a threat to a peace? The answer is yes. And because of those reasons that you can see from here, because the role, the role of poverty, the impact of poverty, you know, to peace actually is very big, very grow. So for the reason, you know, I mean, education is very, very vital. And five ways education can help an extreme poverty. This is five, you know, the, the role of education, okay, to decrease the poverty. And this, how, as we mentioned by Prof. Uh, Sultan Jasna, you know, during uh, Baghdad, okay, time, okay, whereby, I mean, um, students will learn in the Quran and from there they will translate, okay, into the science. That, as a reason, we will see that during those days, all the scholars are very well versed in Islamic education very well versed in Quran, at the same time, they're also very good in science, very good in magic, very good in some other areas. All right, these are, you know, very brief, maybe one minute, okay, uh, on, I mean, some showcase that you seem try to do in order for us, you know, because in Usim, okay, we're having integration of Nakli and Akli in our curriculum, okay, so meaning that we embed in our curriculum, you know, the, the Islamic uh, study as well as the internal study. So you can see that, and this is actually the very brief message about USIM. And if in USIM, we are aiming to be a campus Barakah by 2035. That's our aim. We want our campus to be Barakah campus by 2030, uh, by 2035. Okay, the time is up. Okay, and basically, we are, when we keep track, okay, we, we're having this that we need to follow. Uh, and in fact, you know, the way we arrange our campus, also, we try to be as conscious as possible. Okay, we, we make it so that it aligns with, with, with Kaaba. And this is some of the, you know, uh, international collaboration that we have in many areas. And this is the curriculum, we always integrate Nakli and Nakli. And this is the charismatic insight whereby, I mean, one of the purpose, we want to produce your future Nobel laureate, okay, in our university. This is actually focusing on the talented and gifted children with a very flexible, uh, I mean, curriculum. And they also targeted, you know, to memorize Quran uh, at the age of 15 years old. And it's, you know, the holistic approach taken by USIM for the character building in both students and staff. 25, 21 parameters that need to be available in each of our graduates. And USIM GISO expedition, okay, is compulsory for the student to go abroad at least once. Okay, so this is the program that we have. So we send them to more than 20 countries. This is actually the program, international program that we have among our Islamic Global School Network. We have around about 40 schools around the world okay, in this program, and we're having IGS and Jamboree every year in our campus. And most of our research, actually, we're also doing the integration of Nakli and Nakli. I think that's about all. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dato. Very good timing. Alhamdulillah, I think you. manage the time very, very good. Uh, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, Dato Musa, uh, presentasinya menekankan bidang bagaimana kita mengkawinkan atau memasukkan hati, jiwa ke dalam pendidikan. Dan ini saya rasa sejalan dengan moto Uh, USIM yang apa mengrekonsiliasi uh, antara akli dan nakli itu datuk ya Alhamdulillah we have uh, collaboration with USIM in different areas students as well as lecturers uh, we send our students we send our lecturers and Uh, at the same time, also, we receive uh, students and lecturers from UCM. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much, Dato. Um, next presentation is with uh, our beloved uh, sister, Professor Dato Sri Zaleha Kamarudin.
um, my colleague and we have been uh, working together in IAUM because I was part of IAUM uh, about 12 years and two months in, at IAUM. So she is very familiar to us and uh, she was the former rector of IAUM for seven years. Alhamdulillah. And I think uh, she has done a lot uh, to improve the IAUM. And now she would like to share with us about IAUM experience in internationalization of higher Islamic education institution. So please welcome uh, Professor Datuk Sri Zaleha Kamaluddin. Terima kasih Bapak Anis. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Ibu-ibu dan bapak-bapak yang terhormat ha, Izinkan saya memulakan ucapan di dalam bahasa Melayu Ke ini bahasa Indonesia <laughs> um, Kehadiran saya pada hari ini di Semarang Adalah untuk memenuhi janji saya dengan Prof Anis Akan berada di bumi Semarang Walau apa jika jadi pada hari ini Alhamdulillah saya memenuhi janji saya Dan ini saksinya InsyaAllah uh, saya akan berkongsi tentang tajuk yang diberikan kepada saya Tentang internationalization uh, of the Islamic higher institution uh, IIUM experience Izinkan saya uh, hampir dengan uh, Ya, yeah, hampir dengan uh, ini mana presentation saya ya? Okay, internationalization of higher Islamic education institutions IUM experience. Seperti yang ibu-ibu dan bapa-bapa sedia maklum, IUM adalah rangkaian uh, lima universiti Islam dunia uh, dan uh, inilah satu-satunya institusi yang ditanggung oleh kerajaan. It's a public and private university at the same time because It is a company limited by guarantee so that we can move faster compared to other Islamic universities. So there are five sister universities. One we have IRU uh, I, which is in Islamabad, Pakistan. The other is uh, Islamic University in Niger, Islamic University in uh, Chittagong, Islamic University in Uganda, IUIU. So that's five. Eh? Malaysia, Niger, Uganda, Islamabad, and Chittagong. So we are at a, a uni, a international level where basically we are answerable to OIC. And every year we have to report under education. So we help each other. Unfortunately, uh, the other four Islamic universities are private universities. So if It is very difficult to run universities without money. I think most of the rectors here knows very well, without money, we cannot do much. Alhamdulillah, for Islamic University in Malaysia, we are sponsored by the government, and our uh, running cost is huge. I wouldn't want to, to uh, say, but we have as well a teaching hospital, which is eating up our budget, actually. So it can go into billion, not millions, billion of uh, Malaysian ringgit. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to share with you our international experience because we have been in the market for the past 35 years. So this year, we are celebrating our 35th anniversary and we say 35 years of servicing the Ummah through education. So it's not uh, a commodity where you sell education. We are not selling education. You don't sell education. It's a big no-no. If you are doing that, I think it's haram perhaps. Huh? Now this is our house, or we call it our home, the IIUM home, and all our staff must know this. If they do not know, then they shouldn't be in the university. 
So this is our strategic plan, which runs from 2012 until 2020. So this is our fourth strategic plan and all rectors are in the group. So there's continuity from the first rector who had passed away until uh, the fifth rector. I was the fifth rector and now the sixth rector uh, was the VC of USM, right? of which uh, the minister just now, your minister, uh, is an alumni of USM. So if we want to move forward, we cannot move alone. We have to move and continue like building blocks of a building where uh, we will just continue where our predecessor had left. All right, so basically, uh, uh, our second rector was the one, uh, Dr. Abdul Hamid Sulaiman, Abu Sulaiman, initiated uh, Islamization as the niche of the university. Kebitaraan university. Setiap university mesti ada yang istimewa. Ya, kalau tidak ada, apa yang mahu dimaklumkan kepada dunia Islam? Uh, the current situation, they need every university to have niche. When people ask you what's the niche of your university, immediately you can say, like for ours, it's Islamization. The figure is so small, but I will show you that we have uh, the pillars. We call it the pillars. It's like the arkan of Iman, right? The six arkan of Iman. The, here in the university, Islamization is not the pillar. It is the foundation. Asasnya Islamisasi. So this has been built by the second rector, refined by the third rector, uh, which he defined what Islamization is all about, uh, where he said, oh, basically it's not Islamization, but Islamization. And then uh, Prof. Kamal Hassan, I think all of you know him. He has been doing, I think, um, uh, Order Baru Indonesia in Indonesia. In fact, he runs Islahi program in Indonesia, and I was told as well over here, this university. And the fourth rector, uh, he had created this network with all these universities, and I came in in 2011, thus the strategic plan for 2012 to 2020, making it not as the pillars, but as the foundation of an Islamic university. Now, the niche Islamization, we have to tell our people what Islamization is all about. And when we say, okay, this is what we stand for, all our staff and students must know what Islamization is all about. And sometimes when they don't understand Islamization, we said integrity, integration of knowledge of the human knowledge and the revealed knowledge, the integration. So our younger brother, Usim, they came up with a term of akli and nakli. So it's about the same, but they had to come up with a, another brand, another brand. So we are helping our brothers. Instead of uh, fighting with each other, we should collaborate. But in what way are we collaborating? So this one, I think we should sit together as universities for the Muslim world and for the Muslim Ummah. Because we are not, again, selling education. When students come to our university, this is what they learn. And when they go out, this is the outcome. That they become professionals imbued with Islamic akhlaq. We, uh, this is what you say, the spirit, the ruh, the ruh of education. If they are graduates of our university, but they come out not from uh, having akhlaq as if not from an Islamic university, we don't need them in our university. We tell them out front, if they are here for paper chase, they can go to other universities. We are not interested. So this is the niche of our university and also the niche of our uh, other universities in the Islamic university. Now these are our milestones, it's small, but to achieve this, to achieve Islamization, every year we came out with projects. And to do that, we set up a center for Islamization. We call it centuries that will make sure that all this are there. 
I leave this uh, uh, slides with you so that if you want to have a copy of it, you can get it from Prof. Anas. Yeah, Prof. Anas? Or perhaps from the Panitia that uh, you would want to see how we move forward from 2012 to 2020. We have to sit down, we have to plan where we are going to take this university. So it's a continuation. It is a journey, not during my time as a rector, but also before and after. As the minister said that the intellectual journey is a journey. It's not like one off, right? So we started off with the establishment for the Center of Islam Islamization and then we run Islahi program for our staff so that they know what Islamization is all about. They have to know from, uh, from our administrators, from the rector to the deputy rectors to the deans and the directors, uh, to our lecturers and to our students. They have to know it. How? because we came up with the policies in black and white so that they could refer. We simplify it, everybody must know about it. And then we have our first World Congress, and then we were supported by Triple IT to run and do textbooks. So what we could do is to extend that, and I know Triple IT is doing that with Indonesia, and you could get your association to be involved in coming out with textbooks on any uh, discipline. They will sponsor, inshallah, if you tell them, and they have been sponsoring this project with the university uh, in, uh, I think, more than 16 disciplines, 16 disciplines. At least one textbook for each discipline. And then we can share that textbook all over the world. We don't need only IIUM to use that textbook. We can share it with USIM or Arab universities or, or your uh, uh, BKSPTIS. Uh, that's a, a Badan Kerjasama Perguruan Tinggi Islam Swasta. So we don't have to repeat doing this. All right, so these are the milestones so far for Islamization. And then uh, I am zeroing into internationalization and global network this is also based on 35 years of experience it's not one day it's not two days it's 35 years and alhamdulillah in malaysia we have the highest number of international students in malaysia compared to other universities one because under the malaysian government uh, uh, some universities are only given limited numbers huh? Uh, like uh, USIM, they are only given um, a specialization to educate uh, the Malaysians coming from religious school. Therefore, giving us the opportunity to open our doors for students coming from uh, other countries, especially um, uh, all over. We have the largest number of international students are from Indonesia followed by Thailand, followed by Southern Philippines, and then um, Palestinians, the Rohingyas. We have about more than 115 nations, 115, congregating in IIUM. So that's the 22% of international students in IIUM, right? And then we target, our target is... Uh, by 2020, we will have 30%, which is about 10,000 international students. And we use OIC as the platform to get international students to come in. You just mentioned this to OIC, they will spread the information, students will keep coming. That's where that 10,000 came from. The problem is, most of the time, uh, you can ask uh, Prof. Prof. Dawood, uh, most of them would want scholarship. So this is the problem, the Palestinians. When we have political instability in Yemen, we will have to find money for the Yemeni student. When we have problems with Palestinians, for the past 60 years, they have been having problems. We have to set aside at least 
for Palestinian students. So whenever the world politically are unstable, we would have to be professional beggars to go to rich people to get scholarships for our students. So I became an international beggar, put on a very thick face to ask money from um, rich countries. I know Turkey is not rich, but they are very generous. So this is another source for some of the rectors here to go to Turkey and get Turkish students to come to Indonesia. Indonesia is a very rich in terms of culture, which, which they will never experience in Europe or in Arab universities. This is your uh, strength, Indonesian strength, your culture, your rich culture. Even Malaysia as a modern Muslim country is very lacking in that. You know, so people would want to go not to Jakarta, they would want to go to Jogja, Semarang, places which they could experience Indonesian culture. So this is your strength, go for it. Uh, and then uh, these are our plan to get at least by 2020, 10,500 students uh, congregating. And by 2025, you can plan to have 50% of international students on campus. So they, that will create like OIC, a small OIC, where uh, the students have already established network with each other, congregating in your campus. You can have uh, students from minority countries like Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam, you know, these are from ASEAN countries, but also from Europe, all right? So these are your, uh, I would say, opportunities to offer to the world, for at least for the Muslim world. Uh, but at the same time, you have to prepare as well scholarships. So that's one of the challenges. So this is uh, the champion. Uh, we have a person in charge of this, with the whole structure to assist the running of uh, internationalization and globalization. Without a good structure, you cannot do things. So uh, they came up with the number of students enrolled uh, for undergraduate and postgraduate. But you can get more postgraduates to come to this side of the world because they would want to experience new uh, new knowledge i would say new knowledge yeah? uh, these are enrollment of international students you see uh, the increase of it but you will realize that after 9 11 there is a sudden increase of international students because they could not go to the us although they think that west is best so this is the mentality of Sorry, of Arab. Sorry, Prof. Sultan. The Arabs, they like to go to the U.S. So when the U.S., New York was hit by 9-11, they had to move out. So that's when we got a very high number of Arabs coming to this side of the world. But I would have to remind you from our history that after 10 years, immediately the they have forgotten what happened in New York and they start going back. Again, they have this West is best mentality. West is best mentality. So that's the reason why we are collaborating with Arab universities. Let them finish their first degree at Arab universities and then with the mobility training uh, and uh, they can come over to Malaysia or to Indonesia to spend at least one semester credited at our university. So that gives them the what we call the global graduate experience. So please, eh, if we can work together with Arab universities, uh, your BKSPTIS, uh, this will give uh, our Arab students the opportunity to study uh, in Indonesia for at least one semester or perhaps 10 days. Uh, mind you, they have lots of money. The Arab universities are, Prof. 
you can assure that they will come. We don't have to pay for their accommodation. They will come on their own. Just give them space. This is how we managed to bring in our international students through memorandum of uh, understanding or memorandum of uh, agreement. The more we have our MOU and MOAs, the more international students we can bring. So the latest we had signed, I think, uh, 200 MOAs with Arab universities through our cooperation with uh, Prof. Sultan Orabi. He has been very instrumental in bringing in Arab students through uh, this collaboration. In fact, we have signed, I think, more than uh, 20 MOAs with universities in Indonesia. I remember with uh, uh, Unisula, Unisul, uh, with Unisba, with Muhammadiyah, with, uh, I don't know, but so many I can't remember. But these are good because it shows um, mob mobilization of students from your university to us and from our university to yours. All right, because there are some people who think that university in Southeast Asia are not good, but they have not tried. But once they try, uh, it will spread by word of mouth that our universities have good standards, although we have uh, quality prog uh, assurance issues. But these are things that we improve along the way. Right, so at the moment we have uh, 120 and we will, inshallah, in 2019, 200 uh, MOAs. These are student mobility program. Usin, uh, you make it mandatory for all students to go for mobility. We have not because some students say they don't have the money, but inshallah, uh, uh, we will make it mandatory as well for our students to go for mobility. Uh, students, uh, knowledge means going out, not in the classrooms. Classrooms are, are only meant for formal education. They should go out. We told them out, 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 three times out. If, you, if they're still in, they will have an inward-looking uh, way of doing things. They love to go. You make it mandatory, they will go. The problem is how to go. Fulus. But if each university, for example, we have our mobility program, we take in 20 of, our stu 20 of your students to our universities, we give accommodation, we prepare food for them as a local hospitality, then we will give you another 20 of our students for you to take as your foster children. <laughs> Perhaps that can be done. And I know Indonesians, uh, when it comes to hospitality, uh, you're better compared to us Malaysians. I've, I've uh, experienced Indonesian um, hospitality sampai tahap malu lah. Malu na, na. So when you come to Malaysia, I always tell my counterpart, eh, our, hospita our hospitality must be good, if not better. I think yang bab tu tak, tak terbanding. Ada ke istilah tak terbanding, Prof Anas? Hospitality, ah, tidak terbanding itu. Tak terbandingi. Tak terbandingi. Oh, tak tertanding. I'm learning some uh, Indonesian language today. Tidak tertanding. Uh, kemudian, uh, bagaimana untuk menjadi global brand for Islamic education excellence? Yang ini saya tidak akan menyatakan satu-satu, tapi saya akan tinggalkan juga poin ini kepada panitia so that you can look at, uh, uh, the milestone untuk kita jadi global brand. Sebab dalam dunia yang seber kecil because of the global village, we cannot just be our own. We have to open ourselves. So these are the things that we've done so far and we have also planned until 2020. Next, uh, ini we, what we have done, especially on uh, marketing and promotion, right? Again, we say 
we are not selling education we are telling them what we have please come kan but we have to have quality to attract them and then we have entrance uh, rating and recognition uh, prof daud is in charge of uh, quality assurance entrance uh, global visibility we have to be very visible as well so uh, we have to appoint what we call ambassadors kan among our staff to become ambassadors when they go overseas for lecture or for attending conference they have to uh, do marketing and promotion for the university uh, and become global trend setters we set the global trend not the westerner setting we are not following uh, uh, western model so we have our own model what are the challenges this has been explained by prof sultan we have had the same experience people question us on uh, quality we have to maintain uh, recognition of our programs internationally when we first started uh, in our third year or fourth year our law programs were not accepted in turkey in singapore and then later on 10 years after it was accepted all over the world but our nearest neighbor singapore is not accepting that says a lot about our program either they are doing it because they are jealous or because they feel that we have not come up to the standard right so is this is the same and then how do we sustain international government sponsored students from middle east right these are government scholars normally they will send their good ones to the west and the, the not so good ones to southeast asia so we have to tell the government uh, the middle east uh, eastern government that we are as good as the west it's just that they do not know uh, again uh, these are the list of challenges uh, that i have put which is actually about the same that has been highlighted i i wouldn't want to repeat uh, again uh, these are the challenges well we have a business model canvas uh, because as you know we are not a university uh, run by what we call wakaf uh, we are sponsored by the malaysian government and to run a university is very 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 difficult when money is not around i've mentioned this in my first presentation just now but we have a business model canvas so that we will try to get money to run uh, the operation of the university leaving the rest uh, uh, to oic to assist us uh, in coming up with some businesses so we have our business arm we call it the iim holding with about 14 companies uh, at least to fund the university certain portion of the university i'm not sure about uh, all the rectors are here you have your business arm to give money to the university but we will have to give more dal first like for example the first 100 uh, let's say we give them 40 million to run a private owned uh, hospital for example you have hospitals and then you get money from the hospital you run the hospital uh, give it to the society but you have a business uh, business wing business wing because we have the expertise so we are not taking student fees to run universities but we are taking money from our holding companies to run the university financially for us i think this is my uh, last slide uh, and i uh, would like to say thank you again for your attention bapak-bapak dan ibu-ibu yang telah memberi waktu uh, berkongsi uh, uh, pengalaman kami uh, mengusahakan sebuah universiti what we call this university is for the ummah it's not just for malaysians it's for the ummah and alhamdulillah with that concept we managed to assist uh, the setting up of universities in Maldives using the same concept 
universities in Afghanistan, although they belong to other schools of thought, yeah? some of them like uh, the Maliki School of Thought or the Hanafi School of Thought. Uh, and we have been uh, requested by some other countries as well to assist them to set up universities using our curriculum. So that's part of uh, uh, what we can contribute to the Muslim world and we hope with your assistance as well uh, and your expertise, uh, we will work together for the Muslim Ummah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Datuk Sri, for your good presentation and also uh, good time management. Alhamdulillah, we appreciate it very much. And I think uh, kurang lebih apa yang pengalaman yang tadi di-share dengan kita semua, Alhamdulillah kita banyak mendapatkan hal-hal uh, yang bisa kita uh, jadikan sebagai bahan uh, diskusi dan uh, apa namanya pertimbangan di dalam mengambil keputusan dan kebijakan di perguruan tinggi kita masing-masing. Bapak dan Ibu rahimakumullah. Um, Alhamdulillah dari tiga presenters tadi, kita melihat betapa ketiga-tiganya menekankan pentingnya kita berkolaborasi, kita bergandeng tangan, kita bersama-sama untuk maju bersama, bukan untuk maju sendiri-sendiri, bersama-sama. Dan kesemuanya membuka diri, membuka pintu, kita bersama untuk melaksanakan exchange ini atau mobility in terms of students maupun uh, lecturers dan juga research. Jadi mari kita manfaatkan situasi yang seperti ini untuk kita bersama-sama uh, mengembangkan model pendidikan yang pada akhirnya kita harapkan uh, pendidikan Islam ini maju dan mendapatkan uh, rekognisi secara global dan yang pada gilirannya kita akan juga membawa nama Islam itu sendiri ke seluruh penjuru dunia. Maka Bapak dan Ibu sekalian beberapa model tadi sudah kita dengar bersama. Sekarang adalah sesi tanya jawab ataupun diskusi tapi waktunya nampaknya sangat Uh, terbatas sekali uh, dari apa namanya kita minta satu 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 ini ya ya dokter Nirwan dari UIK Prof Dawud mau ikut juga komen ya yeah, short komen ya yeah. and then dari mana Palangkaraya, Universitas Muhammadiyah Palangkaraya. Good. Uh, Bu Hida dari Unisula. Hida Salihah. Yes, please uh, start uh, Brother Nirwan. And please direct your question or comment to uh, our respective uh, speakers. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, pertanyaan ataupun presentasi Pak sore ini sangat menarik sekali karena uh, presenting two uh, pictures of uh, Islamic education one is from the uh, Southeast Asia uh, represented by Malaysia in this uh, time and then the other one is uh, uh, the picture of Islamic education in uh, uh, Arab world and then what I observe and then what I notice is that uh, uh, our what we call this, uh, let's say, counterpart from Malaysia is talking about uh, values uh, of Islamic education. While uh, our professor from uh, Arab world is talking about the problems that they are facing now in education. So they are, it uh, seems that uh, they are still talking about how to build uh, or to develop educations, while others is thinking about how to develop 
uh, values in uh, Islamic education. My question is, uh, uh, as we know that now, uh, one of the big challenge also, just to, uh, this is what I realize, one of the big challenge of uh, Islamic education in Indonesia in particular, and Islamic universities, is about liberalization. Is about liberalization, secularization, as the, uh, many uh, people have known this. And then, uh, in the Arab world in particular, uh, as we know that the last 10 years, the Arab world has underwent uh, tremendous changes and then has affected, as you mentioned also, your education system. And, uh, and now many people in Indonesia who used to send their children to, to the universities in the Arab world are, uh, you know, began to afraid whether they have to send their children to uh, even to like Marina University or South, uh, what do you call this, uh, Saudi Arabia University, or whatever it is. Because they said that there is a kind of liberalization now is going on in the Arab world, especially in terms of mind. And this is many parents are afraid of, especially in this, uh, what do you call in this country. That's why, as we know, that uh, uh, Unisula itself is now uh, trying to develop uh, a kind of Islamization. They call it budaya, is, uh, budaya Islam, uh, budaya academic Islami, and we in our university in Uika also, uh, it's just also to come to my surprise that in 1983, our former rector already declared that uh, uh, that Uika, our university of Al Khaldun, uh, one of its program is Islamization of science and campus. So the nine, uh, 1983 was the establishment of university. Uh, Islamic University in Malaysia. So, UIKA already declared that this is part of their program. So, this is my question that about liberalization in, in what we call this in Arab world, whether it affected the, the education and Islamic system of education over there. And another thing is that uh, now in Indonesia, uh, anytime in any place when lecturers meet each other, they, they will be talking about scopus. <laughs> They're talking about this is a scopus disease. I am just afraid sometimes whether that lecturers now are pursuing uh, just uh, a scopus or they are going to educate the children. Because as mentioned by Professor Datuk Musa, uh, he's talking about education without soul, as Professor Harry Lewis said in his book, Excellent Without a Soul. And then, now people, are, lecturers are now pursuing about uh, the scopus index and, and on all these kind of things. And then we are now seems to be trapped within a kind of a business yeah? because when you want to publish we have to pay and then now my suggestion because this is BKS PTES where all the universities especially private universities Islamic private universities where they want to have our standard of publishing or we want just to follow this kind of trend now about Scopus because the Scopus they have their own standard especially we in our in our parts in Islamic religion for Islamic uh, religious studies Sometimes we are proposing some ideas which are, in, which are in contradictory probably with their principles, probably they do not want to publish. Because the, the, some of the principles that we uphold probably are not in line with their principles. So this is my question whether in the Arab world in particular, whether you have also this kind of disease, the Scopus disease, is affected uh, lecturers over there. And here is my professor, Professor Ibrahim Zain is now <laughs> Uh, is now in Qatar. <laughs> uh, this kind of thing is uh, also is going on in that in, uh, country. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, you have already taken. You want to respond now, Peter? Okay. Yes, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Shukran jazeel, my dear brother. I will try to answer the last question. Yes, uh, most of the Arab countries, they are going through some political instability in the region, some problems. And we had in the past, as we said, a lot of students from Malaysia in particular, in Brunei, Indonesia, even from South Thailand, they are studying in the Arab world. I was president of three universities in Jordan. 
And that time, we used to have so many students, Islamic students from all over the world. And we treat those students in Jordan just like the Jordanian students when it comes to oceans and peace. They study Arabic or Islamic studies or Islamic banking. They just pay a little amount of money. One time when I was president of Yarmouk, we had 800 students from Malaysia alone. 800. <laughs> Jordan still until now, very stable country. We have no war. And it is easy for any Muslim students to come to Jordan to study. Therefore, the doors are open. No problems. There is a problem in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Libya, but other countries widely open. You go to Morocco, you can, students can study there. In Algeria, they can study. Even in Egypt, even in Egypt, sometimes you find some people are afraid of this. But I was in Egypt just two or three weeks ago, and there is no problem in Egypt. Therefore, for students from the Islamic countries, they are more than welcome to come and study. And they have been treated in a nice way. I will give you one example. And Dr. Zalik and Dr. Musa, they know. We have signed agreement with the state of Bahang in Malaysia, Kuantan. The students study two years in Kuantan, and they use our curriculum after they pass the two years, they can come to Jordan and stay two more years, and they get a degree from Jordan. This is called two plus two, a sandwich program, and this still exists. We welcome all your students to come, not only in Arabic or Islamic studies, even medicine, pharmacy, engineering. And the challenges facing the Arab world facing the Muslim world as well, facing Malaysia. When I come and I talk about brain drainage, we have the same problem here in Indonesia, or if I'm in Pakistan, or Bangladesh, because the low salaries in the Arab countries and in the Muslim countries. Therefore, the same challenges, but we have to work together. That's the most important thing. The Muslim countries, we should work together. We should put our hands together. We should open the borders. Not problems to go to some countries with a visa. Sometimes if I want to go to some of the Gulf countries, it is not easy to go there. Why? Where are the Americans or the British can go easily? Therefore, we have to open the visa for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Sultan. Yes, next, Prof. Dawood, please. You have your comment. Yes. yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm going to uh, just draw your attention to the main theme of what has been discussed. The main theme was how to Islamize a Muslim university. How to Islamize, how can we say this is a Muslim university? What are the standards of judging whether it is an Islamic university or not? To tell you the truth, the first thing to do, we have to ask ourselves to what extent the human beings at the university are Islamized. Are our heart Islamic, our mind Islamic, our behavior Islamic, then our decision will be Islamic. So number one is how to be good Muslims as university leaders and university staff, academic staff and administrative staff so that our decisions will be Islamic. Number two, 
our program are integrating revealed knowledge and acquired knowledge. So we have to ask ourselves whether psychology or engineering or medicine or sociology or whatever is integrated and based on an Islamic perspective. Now, that needs a lot of work. IIUM has done a lot in this respect. But you have a council of more than 200 universities here in Indonesia. You can do it very easily. You can divide the work among yourself. And we can provide all Muslim universities with our experience at IIUM. Second, the most important thing that Muslim university preparing or shaping the personality of Muslim students in terms of knowledge, in terms of professional skills, and in terms of akhlaq. So we want to shape the mind, the heart, and the action professionally of our students. That means our environment at the university should be conducive into the building of a Muslim personality, the environment. Also, our priorities of research should be based on maqasid al-sharia, on what our needs in Indonesia. What are the priorities of research in Indonesia? Based on our needs and necessities in Indonesia. So that's again is a standard so that we don't just aim at publishing a scopus but to fulfill the needs of our context and the priorities of research. Yeah. Also, what is the nature of relationship between student and lecturer? It's very important. Is it based on respect and brotherhood and sisterhood or dictatorship? We are talking here about akhlaq-based lecturer and student relationship. Again, this is another standard of a Muslim university. Also, all our decisions and regulation at the university should be based on a value-based and manner-based justice, honesty, integrity, and so on. So we are fair university. Also, the teacher is a murabbi, not just a knowledge transmitter, not just to bring up professionals, no, to bring up persons who are worshipping Allah and serving their own society. So our mission should be different, should be different. And finally, tomorrow I'll be talking about the tool we have developed for the Muslim universities, what are the standards and how to measure the performance of universities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Dawood, for your comment. And uh, next, uh, please, sister from uh, Universitas Muhammadiyah Palangkaraya. Introduce your name and uh, direct your question yes. to our respective uh, Speakers. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Ika Windiarti, ST Master of Engineering, PhD. Uh, I come from Muhammadiyah University of Palangkaraya. I'm very inspired with uh, all of your presentation. Uh, this is uh, narrow, uh, broadening my knowledge about how. Islamic education should run in Indonesia because honestly I only been four months to join the Muhammadiyah University of Palangkaraya before uh, I'm studying in Australia for almost 10 years to doing my master and PhD well um, Particularly, I am uh, very interested with what uh, Professor Dato Sri Dr. Zaleha explanation about how um, we internationalize 
the Islamic education? Well, uh, maybe for big cities in Indonesia, there will be no problem uh, with uh, human resources. What I'm talking about human resources is the lecturer. The lecturers already have a good uh, skill in English because the English is the, the, the most important capital in teaching in internationalization. But uh, in our province, but, uh, I'm talking about uh, Central Kalimantan, it's not easy to find lecturers that mastering English very well to deliver the material of education. So we have, we do have international students, but then um, the lecturers that have good English should master almost all the, all the subjects <laughs> in order to the material could be delivered. So uh, maybe if you can give us a specialized, a specialist, uh, particularly for BKS PTIS suggestion to improve the English skill of the lecturers, uh, especially for uh, Islamic universities, human resources, in order to our university in um, province other than Java, in, yeah, uh, can also be global, being uh, having interna international students and then also maybe going for international seminar like this kind of seminars. So yeah, your suggestion is very um, mes most welcome. I am very uh, looking forward for your suggestion. Thank you very much. The last one, I think, uh, the, uh, Sister Hidayatul Saliha from Unisula. Yes. Unisula. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for uh, the opportunity for me to pose my question. I have one question for each uh, speaker, that's fine. But I, I'm trying to be, uh, I mean that to the point. The first question I share, uh, the prob uh, I mean that the first question is quite similar with, uh, with her from uh, the lecturer from Palangkaraya. But the problem is different. Uh, when you say that for internalization of IEUM, uh, you encourage international students to, uh, to enroll in your university. And that's also uh, happened here, I mean, in this university. But the problem is, as a lecturer, I got difficulties to teach them. And uh, this problem also happened to several uh, college because I don't know maybe I'm sure that you have international office do you have that and I want you share the quality of international office in your university because uh, I mean that I feel so sorry for the student from other countries when they are studying here because they, uh, they got difficulties in the language in the adjustment of the culture and etc and they got very poor. Several students uh, from other countries get very poor in my classroom. That for you, please sharing the quality of international office. Maybe this information is useful for our colleagues who work in international office. And the second one, for the second speaker, please, uh, can you share with me, practically as the lecturer, uh, what you do to manage the classroom or to apply the method or to, I mean that, to share the material in order to be able to combine between ACL and knuckle. What I'm doing now is just by, um, how to say, uh, how to say, internalize, um, put, put Al-Quran into, into science, just like that. Is that enough or can you share the practical things so can enrich my experience? And the last one, um, I think it's very interesting when I know that 
uh, Professor Dato Ibrahim told us there is a problem in the quality of research. And one of the reasons because your government, your government just spent a little, a little in the infrastructure. How can that happen? Because your country is rich country. So what uh, you do as as researcher to encourage your government to spend more money for doing a good quality of research? Because I think that's very important to develop your country. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Bu Ida, for these questions. And uh, first, I would give the mic to Prof. Dato Sri. I will uh, spend five minutes to explain uh, things which are more serious than English. English, to me, is just a tool for communication, tool for the knowledge. What we are facing now uh, in the future studies perspective, eh? future studies is a discipline which has explained and couldn't explain what is happening in the world today. And it is called, uh, we are living in abnormal times. Yes? Satu waktu yang tidak terjangka. Kalau itu bahasa Indonesia nya. Yang tidak terjangka, abnormal times. We cannot predict. We cannot predict. For example, in Indonesia, can you predict or not when Gunung Merapi akan meletus? Boleh kan? Boleh. But the world has come so crazy. For example, who would be expecting Donald Trump to become the president of America? Tidak terjangka. Who would have expected Macron to be the president of France? He has no party before that. Who would have expected that? Who would have expected a terrible climate change? In fact, a few months ago, a few countries are suffering a very high temperature. Higher than what a normal human body can take. More than 50 degrees Celsius. We cannot take it, but this is the world that we are living in. In Malaysia, political upheaval. Who would have suspected, assumed, Tun Mahathir will become the Prime Minister again at the age of 93. Also unexpected, luar biasa. And because of we are living in the world of luar biasa, the teaching for our students as well must be luar biasa. Abnormal, we cannot teach our students what we have been taught during our time. No. It's not about, uh, well, we are talking about Islamizing knowledge. We are talking about integrating uh, human knowledge and uh, revealed knowledge. But we have to answer today's problems. How do we find solutions for that? Can we teach our students how to react? No, we have to ask them to teach. We have to teach us, the lecturers, first. To, to go and use unusual approach for unusual circumstances. This, I think, your majlis, panggil apa ya? Badan. Your badan must work and move the rectors to go into new curriculums. The current curriculum is not adequate to answer abnormal times. We may say that we can predict, but who can predict the worst climate for the world? Indonesia is facing that problem. Whenever there's earthquake, earthquake first you started off with Bali, after Bali, Lombok. Lombok, we, when Lombok had their earthquake, I was like reading, trying to see whether Lombok has been hit by earthquake before or not. It, it, if it has been hit, whether this is worse than the previous 
uh, earthquake. So they are talking about meramalkan kemusnahan dunia, right? Predicting or through calculation which is not correct anymore. So this is more serious than English as a tool. Forget lah English as a tool. As long as you send your people for training, send your lecturers for mobilization program, get them to understand or study the pedagogy of reacting to future studies. Let them come up with solutions on how to solve the problem. Not that I'm saying, oh, at least they could predict why Donald Trump is there for America and, his, and he is anti-Islam. Why Macron is there? Why this? Why that? So we must start asking these questions. But I am uh, summarizing my answers to this. We have to work together, come out with a solution on how to solve the world problem through understanding the risk of what is to come, which we don't know. We don't know what is hitting us in the world today. So we have to learn what we call the abnormal times. Kalau, kalau mungkin uh, dari perspektif Islam ini kita namakan zaman fitnah. Eh? Uh, trying to understand what is happening. So this is more important. I am suggesting badan to sit down to discuss more substance issues rather than secondary issues. Language is not a problem. You can just invent the translator, put it on your ears, solve, done. All right? So uh, the rest, I think uh, some of us can answer that. Perhaps we can have a smaller meetings which we can address the problem. But saya minta ibu-ibu dan bapak-bapak secara serius, saya datang dari Kuala Lumpur membawa berita yang, yang saya rasa tidak bagus ya. Di, bagi siapa yang mengkaji oceanografi ya, sebagai contoh oceanografi uh, laut kita sudah menjadi asidik yang menyebabkan uh, obor-obor ya, membiak dan ikan-ikan menjadi pupus itu adalah tindakan natural kepada usaha yang tidak ada intervensi kerana we are looking inward rather than outward. Dan ini adalah kesan manusia kepada alam. Dan kita sebagai expert must be spearheading solutions. We are taking care of universities. Actually, we are taking care of experts. And experts are taking care of knowledge. So, we are the knowledge bearers. It is in our hands to solve world problems. Not just Muslim world problem, but world problem. So I am re really requesting your assistance to take charge. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sri. Uh, next, uh, Prof. Datuk Musa. This is about uh, whether combining the akli and nakli is just uh, like ayatisasi in Indonesia. Just put an ayah in certain context. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jadi menjawab uh, apa ni uh, soalan berkaitan dengan model untuk integrasi nakli akli. Alright, jadi sebenarnya eh, tidak ada. There is no definite model that we can use and can fit for all. Okay, just like okay when you want to plant, you may, when you want to go to forest and there is no uh, pathway at all, you need to start with yourself, okay? Jadi kena lihat puncaknya dekat atas, yang sini ada pokok besar tu nak tebang, jadi semaknya agak sikit, okay? Jadi kita akan tebas, okay? Dengan kita tebas tu, kita akan buat denai dan kita berjalan. Kita berjalan sikit, orang belakang akan tengok, eh, bagus ni. Dia dah buat denai, dia akan ikut kita di belakang, okay? So basically, there is no proper model. I suppose you, you are having the Islamization, okay? We are going to... Towards the same directions, 
but the pathway that we took, that we take normally, maybe slightly different, but inshallah, one we got to reach there. Right. And I have to make it very clear, okay, when you do the integrations, nakli and akli, it's not just simply abel ayat, satu ayat, and then uh, abel satu dapatan, sign combine, okay? Because science very dynamic. Science yang kita nampak fakta hari ini, mungkin tomorrow, I mean, it's different already, okay, because of the new funding. But Quran actually is there, okay, the real truth is Quran. So we need to be very careful with that. So, I mean, to, 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 to be in short, what I, can what I can share with you, actually, the way we work in USIM, okay, we work in a, in a group. Even the paper that I presented just now, the paper that I, pre that I presented just now, actually, it, it just consists of me uh, as a scientist, chemistry, and uh, we have also somebody from the uh, education faculty. We have one, I mean, we have the Dean, Faculty Quran and Sunnah, and we have somebody from uh, Faculty of uh, Sharia and Law, and we have also somebody, you know, from I mean, bi bi biology background. So, I mean, our presentation, our presentation just now, actually, basically based on our Tari discussion, on how we put things together, and hopefully it will be um, easily, you know, understood by, by the audience. So similarly, you know, with the, with, with, the, with the presentation of, you know, the lectures okay, in the lecture theatre, for instance, for my subject, when, because I'm a chemist, I'm teaching environmental chemistry. You know, I used to teach chemistry, what we call chemistry toto, chemistry and that's it. But in UC, we need to teach environmental chemistry with some facts coming from the Quran. And there's so many verses in, in the Quran that easily, okay, you can embed you can present it together, you know, with the, with the uh, environmental chemistry facts, you know. And the way we do it, actually we do it together. Okay, with the Ustaz there, Ustaz, ayat ni masuk macam ni, macam ni ke, it translate, translation macam ni ke, do it together. And in fact, in some subject, Ustaz will also involve in the teaching. Okay, but in, in, in the long run, when we have this kind of training, we also having, you know, the, the what you call it, I mean, the, the um, I mean, the experience okay, to run ourselves, okay, that more or less. But we have, you know, in general, because now, okay, when we said we have integration of NACLI and NACLI in our curriculum, so what happened, MQA, Malaysia Quality Agency, when they come, you know, to audit our program, they want to see that. Whether is it really integration in your subject? And then whether, you know, the integration is this a part of the questions? Is this part of the um, education objective? That we check everything, okay? So, well, we invite, okay, because of it's more, like, more or less like a sharing. We invite if you like to come. I think some universities, you know, from Indonesia, for instance, University, University, University Islam, Negeri Malang, okay, I think we're having, uh, I mean, once they come, they, they came to USIM and we're having discussion together. Because also sharing, you know, the same, uh, the same aspiration. So, again, like what Dato uh, Zela mentioned just now, under this uh, apa ni, badan kerja sama guruan, I think this is the best platform. And I'm more than willing, you know, if maybe, um, you know, I mean, we have collaboration between this badan and maybe, you know, with our university, you know, in Islamic University in Malaysia, okay, to share on how we can move this, okay? Because by having that, I think we, we can have some solid methodology uh, to do this. Okay, I think I hopefully that gives you know some some small answer. If I can if I can take opportunity to respond to Dr. Nirwan just now, okay, Dr. Nirwan just now asking about the uh, Scopus disease, okay, uh, Scopus disease. We used to have the same problem as well, but to me, Scopus Scopus actually is not a disease, but actually it's a platform whereby you can you know I mean you can enhance your skill. Kalau saya suruh bapak buat satu rumah besar, kita tak ada pengalaman untuk buat rumah, kita tengok rumah tu, oh, tak bisa buat ni sebab besar sangat, betul tak? Tapi kalau kita ditrain macam mana untuk buat rumah berkenaan, dan kita ada skill itu, dan kita dibimbing bersama-sama okay, dengan dos pakar dalam buat rumah, kita akan rasa confidence. One day kita boleh teraju untuk buat rumah berkenaan. So that's exactly what I have experienced so far. Before I joined USIM, actually, I was with UC Kebangsaan Malaysia for more than 25 years. And UKM actually is a, is a research university, so uh, it's not only Scopus, it's slightly above ISI. It's not only ISI, Q1 and Q2. 
At that time when I started, you know, my career in UKM, actually use, UKM actually is not being declared as uh, open research university yet. Okay, in fact, I just, you know, when I do my research, I want my research to be, to be able to be read, you know, by, by my, my peers, not only in my university, not only in Malaysia, not only regional, but it has to be global. So every two years, you know, I will attend a conference in Europe, even though it's very expensive, I make a point. Okay, so that I will mingle around with all the professors, this the one that really guide us in a way, indirectly, on how to do the publishing. And the connection that we have, because most of them, they are the, what you call it, the editors of those journals. So when you know them, actually it's much easier, okay, for you, I mean, for your paper to get through in a way, okay, they will guide you. In fact, my supervisor was one of the chief editors of Q1 journal. And when I was a student, they, I mean, he used to train me. Some papers coming from China, from India, they asked me to do the, the comments. Okay, I mean, based on that training. So even now, I, I still publish in Q1 journal. Uh, in fact, I prefer ISI rather than Scopus. If you say it's very expensive, but you can find a lot of other journal that is free for you. The one that you need to pay normally is open access journal. Okay, because I mean, very easy for the researchers to get. I mean, to get to get the copy of your articles. That, that's why they need. They didn't have to pay, but you the one they need to pay. But you can also send to many journal. Okay, that, that is a free available. So to me, looking at Scopus or ISI, to me actually, you know, it just uh, it, it's a merely a platform uh, for me. You know, I mean, to to really ensure that the that the research that I'm doing is of international standard. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dato Musa. Uh, the final one, I think, uh, Prof. Sultan, with regard to the poor scientific research due to the lack of somehow about finance uh, support or something like that. I will try to be short this time because I think the time is running so fast. While concerning the poor scientific research in the Muslim war, there are so many reasons behind this. One of the important things we can do is joint research. Let us work together. For example, I work with Western scientists in Europe <coughs> or in the States. But why I should not work with people from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Brunei, that's the way we should do. We should have groups where we have infrastructure is available. We should invite people from the Islamic world to work together. And also when it comes to publication, scientific journal, we should do the same thing. Another question about the quality of teaching and the quality of teachers how we improve those teachers. We should have some training programs for those fresh graduates. Nowadays, the whole world is going fast. And a lot of people graduating from good universities and from middle class or even from low classes of universities. If we don't give those graduate students the training programs, they wouldn't know how to teach. We should have workshops, seminars, training programs for those people here. Concerning the language, I think everybody should be proud of his or her language. We should use our local languages. But it doesn't mean you should not learn a second language. You should learn a second language. We are Muslim here. Yes, you have the Malay language, or the Urdu language, or the Persian. But the language of Quran is the Arabic language. I think we should learn it. And also we should learn another language, German, Spanish, English. English is becoming the scientific language. Learning languages is very important as receiving a doctorate degree or a master degree. 
Thank you. Shukran. Thank you very much, Prof. Sultan. I think uh, because of the time, otherwise uh, the discussion is very interesting. Many issues need to be addressed. But then I think what has been uh, presented by our three speakers, uh, we have somehow broader pictures about the situation of our higher ed Islamic education institution. And uh, we have to sit together within our association. This is uh, PKS, PTES. We need to discuss this matter and then to uh, materialize in uh, our next programs and activities in order to improve uh, the quality of our uh, Islamic education. Baik Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, uh, kita berikan sekali lagi uh, tepuk tangan yang meriah kepada tiga presenters. Dan kita terima kasih. Thank you very much for the three presenters, for the very uh, interesting presentation. And insya Allah, uh, we'll continue tomorrow for the uh, further program. Dan terima kasih juga kepada Bapak Ibu sekalian yang telah meluangkan waktu untuk bersama-sama kita uh, mensukseskan uh, program pada sore hari ini. Mudah-mudahan ini bermanfaat untuk kita semua dan kita mari kita bersama-sama bergandeng tangan untuk bersama-sama maju mengembangkan uh, lembaga pendidikan Islam kita bersama. Demikian, saya rasa waktu saya kembalikan kepada uh, pembawa acara dan barangkali ada token of appreciation dari uh, Prof. Sultan, the President of Association of the Arab Universities. Demikian, saya kembalikan kepada MC, terima kasih. Dari saya, mu, bila ada yang kurang berkenan, mohon dimaafkan. Wabilai Taufik, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Bapak Anis Malik Toha. The Honorable Speakers, please kindly remain in the stage because Universitas Islam Sultan Agung would like to present token of appreciation for sharing your ideas, knowledge, and insight. To present the token, kindly invited Vice Director of Academic Avail of Universitas Islam Sultan Agung, Bapak Bejo Santoso, PhD. The first token will be presented to Professor Dr. Sultan Abu Orabi Aladwan, PhD, FRCS from Association of Arab University. And vice versa, Association of Arab University also would like to present token of appreciation to Universitas Islam Sultan Agung Semarang for extraordinary support to Rakernas and International Conference PKS PTES 2018. The next token presented to Professor Dr. Professor Dato Dr. Musa Ahmad from University Sains Islam Malaysia. The next token presented to Professor Dato Sri Dr. Zaleha Kamarudin, Rector of International Islamic University Malaysia. And the token of appreciation also 
presented to Bapak Haji Anis Malik Toha, LCMA PSD, for leading this session. Thank you, and please kindly be seated. Take picture together here. Here, bro. Here, here. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the very end of the session of Rakernas and International Conference PKS PTES 2018. On behalf of the House and the committee, we would like to extend once again our deepest appreciation to you all for your support and participation. Hope this conference will be very beneficial for all the participants here. Once again, thank you and see you on the next occasion. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hadirin yang kami